afternoon. Uh, so my name is Ian Tan, and I'm going to talk about some uh, dangerous secrets of open source. Um, so at the end of this talk, I, I hope you get a couple things. Um, number one, uh, I hope you learn how to blow the head off of an armored tank using open source. We're going to talk about how you do that. Number two, we're going to talk about how you can break into SaaS services uh, using open source. Uh, and number three, hopefully, uh, you'll understand some context about why it's really important to have a great security team and one that is this highly collaborative. So um, that's the, that's, those are my goals for today. If you're in security, I hope this is familiar. And if you're new to security, I hope we get some tools out of this that you can learn from. So who's giving this talk? Uh, my name is Ian Tian. I grew up in Markham, Ontario. I went to Waterloo. Um, I was a Microsoft engineer, had a couple, do I had a dozen patents, head of Outlook and OneDrive, a lot of users. Uh, I ran a video game company for a little bit, backed by Y Combinator, and then uh, we started the open source project called Mattermost, and now I'm CEO. We've raised $70 million. We got a booth in the back, and you know, life is good. So, um, and the context of this talk um, is really from um, both the video games and, and working in open source software. So, what Mattermost does is we're collaboration for technical teams. Um, if you think about like in the 2000s, I don't know how many of you were born, but um, you would used to have like an email client, and you'd have a rich text editor, an address book, and you'd have a calendar. And there's this thing that Outlook came out called Outlook that replaced them all and made them sort of one thing. And you know, at Mattermost, that's what we do. We kind of take, hey, you've got your audio and visual and screen share and conference calls and Discord and messaging and release management and incident management, all these apps that technical teams use, and we just make it one thing. So the way that Outlook simplifies you know, some of these productivity things, you know, that's what we do for, for technical teams. Uh, and it's been pretty amazing. We've had 4,000 contributors, open source contributors, people that don't work at our company that are actually building things uh, for this project. And that's been over 30,000 code contributions. So it's really exciting to see that work and also the impact that it's had globally. So um, our commercial customers, if you add up their market capitalization, it's over $5 trillion. About a third of our business is in public sector, which is governments, defense organizations, regulators. Um, and they're protecting about $25 trillion in gross domestic products. So um, the context we're coming from is you know, public sector and developers. But that's, that's not where this, this first thing kind of comes from. So how do you blow the head off of an armored tank that doesn't come from our work with the Department of Defense? That actually comes from my time in video games. So um, when we were building video games, uh, we were doing a, a military game. And our art director was from Lucasfilm, and just an amazing guy. Um, and he wanted to be realistic, so we got uh, a couple of consultants that were, that were US military, uh, graduates of West Point, which is one of the leading uh, military colleges in the United States. This was a company commander, uh, commanded an infantry division. And uh, we want to know, it's like, well, we're making a video game. We, we, we want to be credible, so we want you to help us vet some of our designs. And this uh, M2 Bradley uh, ar light armored tank. And, uh, and the Lucasfilm guy was, was, was showing him the designs. And the Army guy's like, no, no, you don't have it right. Um, there should be a little collar around the turret of that tank. Because what would happen is, um, when, when the tanks were in battle, a, a rocket-propelled grenade sometimes got a lucky shot and end up underneath the turret. And if the grenade ended up underneath the turret, it would blow the head off the tank. So what they did is they added a piece of metal around, around, the, uh, around the tank collar so that wouldn't happen, so that, that vulnerability would be defended. And, uh, and our Lucasfilm guy is like, look, I've, I've looked all over the internet. Like, there's a lot of pictures of this. And I'm trying to find a reference. And I can't find this, this collar that you're describing anywhere. So the, uh, the, the Army guy goes, OK, hold on, no problem. I'm going to go out and take a picture. And then we realized he's on a military base. And like this M2 Bradley to him is like a Toyota Camry. So like there's driving this around, it's his everyday you know, vehicle to, to be transported from here to there. And it was taking a picture, and the Lucasfilm guy and I, we were like freaking out. We're like, we're in a US military base taking pictures of like, mil like these vehicles. Like, how is that okay? Like, how how did this just happen? And what we found out was was pretty amazing. So the plans for all the armored vehicles are effectively open source, they're actually published. So you can actually go and find out the designs of these armored vehicles for the US military. Now, you, the electronics are all confidential. 
um, but the actual military hardware is out there, and it's essentially open source. And if you actually look into it, you can actually find a lot of vulnerabilities around the N2, N2 Bradley take, not just the RPG, but all these other areas. And what they do is they, they, they open source it, they document it, you can learn all about it, and you know, that's actually what makes the vehicle more secure over time. This is a vehicle designed in 1981. It's 40, it's, it's 40 years old. Whatever secrets there are about the vehicle are kind of out there now. So I um, just want to give you one, you know, maybe uh, example of open source and, and security that you might not have anticipated. I didn't know I was going to run into that. Um, but I'll tell you the secret one that I'm going to share about, open, about security. Nothing useful can be secure. All useful systems have vulnerabilities. We can reduce vulnerabilities. We can never eliminate all of them. So if you're new to security, that's one principle. You can use it everywhere. Not, if anyone says something's secure, you know that you know, from a security context, you're going to ask them some questions. You know, the example is it's a light armor tank, right? Um, the, all the things that can blow up a light armor tank are just ordinances. So, but the problem is if you make the armor more heavy, it's not going to be light anymore. So it's going to have less range, and that's going to be a vulnerability. It's going to be heavier. That's a vulnerability. So you're always making trade-offs. Another example in the software world, let's say there's password. Everyone's got passwords. Well, if you've got a password, someone can guess your password. There's something called a brute force attack. They'll just try every combination, you know, commonly used passwords, and they'll guess your password. OK, so then you say, well, let me defend that. So then you say, OK, I'm going to add a policy, and it's three tries, and you're locked out. Three tries, and you can't try anymore. But now you've actually just shifted the vulnerability. Now you're vulnerable to a denial of service attack. Someone can go in and guess three passwords and lock you out of your account. You can never make a useful system secure. You can only shift around the vulnerability. So this is you know, the takeaway. Security is really about trade-offs, usefulness of whatever you're building, the risk that you're under from these vulnerabilities, and then the resources that go into how do you make things more and more secure. You can only go so far. So now you can go talk to your security friends, show up, you know, go to the cocktail parties, and then talk some security. That's secret one. Um, secret two, these are three letters everyone should have. There's so many software companies. Every software company should have an RDP. A software uh, RDP is a responsible disclosure policy. It, it is absolutely impossible for your security team, for your engineers, even the smartest in the world, to find all the vulnerabilities in your system. It's impossible. There's always going to be people out there in the community that will find these. And what you want to do is you want to create a responsible disclosure policy for how that information, when they find the vulnerability, not if, when they find the vulnerability, how do they report it to you? How do they do it in a responsible way that you can confirm and have conversations about it, and that you can actually fix the issue and keep your community, your end users, your customers safe through a responsible disclosure policy. And as part of that, you know, the, the security research will get recognition. There's a whole um, category. Of, there's a whole sort of industry on how this works. Um, sometimes they just do it for recognition. Sometimes you have bug bounties. Uh, it's, it's really important to have these programs. And what you do is you get the information, you patch it, whether you're a SaaS service or your software, and then you harden. You say, like, well, if that's a vulnerability, what else do we have to look around here? Let's, let's take a look at our security and just repeat it over and over again, communicate out. So that, that cycle of a responsible disclosure policy is part of this framework. You're going to invest resources. You're going to put resources in a responsible disclosure policy and working with your community. Um, and your risk was going to go down because you've got this cycle of getting more and more secure every cycle. You'll never be perfect, but that's the system. And if you're in a software company, if you're doing a startup and you don't have an RDP, you have to realize the, uh, the risk that you're under because you're not going to find all the security issues. Um, and secret number three, last one here, is really about doing the right thing, being on the other side of that responsible disclosure policy, being part of the security community, being part of the engineering community, being part of the technical community. So what's kind of obvious when you're building software is you want to vet your dependencies. I'm going to use an open source library. I'm going to use a database. I'm going to use this, you know, whatever this vendor built, and really understanding what those dependencies are. That's kind of obvious. What's sort of non-obvious and so important when you want to build a security practice within your company um, is you want to support your supply chain. So what are the other things that are, that are feeding it? Even if you don't use it, if, imagine you spotted a vulnerability in a library that you were considering that, that was really bad, that could really compromise a lot of systems. Do you say, well, I'm not going to use that. Let me just continue looking for the other things. Or do you actually take resources from your own company and, and figure out a way you can, you can report that issue and, and get it fixed. So that's supporting your supply chain. It's counterintuitive. I and mean, there's so many startups, 
so many companies, security teams are stretched, how much bandwidth do you have to secure things that aren't even like part of your product? Um, but it's, it's kind of non-intuitive, but it's so important because you want to build that security practice. That's what we did 2020, August. This is what I'm going to share because it's old. August 2020, we found a vulnerability in the Golang ecosystem um, that could do what was called uh, SAML authentication bypass. What that means is I can, I can, you know how you log into things? There's a bug in how the login works, and anyone using Golang and this certain library was potentially susceptible to it. We found it in August. We worked with Google, and we just did a lot of work. We talked to people with downstream libraries. We talked to end users that were impacted. We were not impacted at all. But we spent three months from August to December um, really taking just contributing to that community. And the, the thing that we found, we just figured, had to make it safe. The big problem is when you find something, you, can, you don't want to tell very many people. There was for, 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 for uh, that whole time, there's only five people in our company that actually knew about the issue because it was so dangerous if it kind of got out. Um, and that's what it means to be sort of part of the community. And just um, let me tell you. Uh, how to break into SaaS services. This worked in 2020. I'm sharing with you now because uh, it's taken care of. But you know, two years ago, um, you had a login service that used XML. And the design of the authentication was, OK, well, there's all this heavy-duty encryption and security stuff. And they get the result back. And the bug was they didn't check the result. They just assumed you did all this heavy-duty encryption stuff. And they just never checked. So for the people that aren't technical, let me just give you an analogy. This is, this is not accurate, but it's an analogy. Imagine you, get a, you go to Ticketmaster, and you get a ticket, and it's for Machine Head Show. And it's got a UPC code, and you bought the ticket, and all these things. Well, imagine you could take a, a red marker and, and cross out Machine Head and write Taylor Swift. And instead of like a student discounted ticket, you say VIP all access pass. And you could write that. And then you go to the ticket taker, and the ticket taker scans your, your barcode and says, that looks good. And you get into the Taylor Swift concert, and you get all access pass. That was this bug that we found in Golang. Golang would, would take the, you know, the, the file and be like, yeah, that's good. They wouldn't, they wouldn't check it against manipulation. No one ever tried, like, well, as far as we know. Maybe some other people knew about this issue. But no one had ever tried taking that heavy, after the heavy duty encryption and all the stuff comes back. And it's like, we're just going to change it. And, and that was the vulnerability. And there's five people that knew about it, plus Google. Uh, and it took us you know, three months to go and, and fix all that. Um, but the uh, security is really all about making these trade-offs. And it's really about balancing usefulness and your risk and your resources. And when you invest in that supply chain, uh, it's, it really sends a signal to your team, to your organization, and to the community, and to your customers. You know, this is, this is a secure, this is a, a company that cares about security. And especially if you're a startup, I'll say this, you know, we sell to you know, large enterprises and governments. And the first things they do when they're thinking about doing a deal with us is they try to figure out who's in charge of security. They just go and look at our personal profiles, and they, they look us up, and they try to figure out who's in charge of security, and what have you done in the security space. So you know, think about that signal that you're sending to the market and, and to everyone um, around who you are and what you stand for. All right. So, so thank you very much. Just to wrap up, you know, if these are secrets to you, um, and, and you know, if these are secrets to you and these are kind of new, uh, and you're, you're in a software company, think about investing in a security organization, one that's collaborative, one that will bring along, that's not just kind of in the corner, but one that's going to engage with your leadership and your engineers um, and your product team and, and everyone else. Um, and empower that security team to participate in the global community. Have you know, these, uh, these conversations, ethical security research, um, receiving those reports, engaging with those re reporters, the people that do report, um, and actually making your own reports. Really think about that, because it can really define the, the level of security professionals you can bring in and, and how you think about the practice. Um, and then this is really important. You have to actually expect that every system will be breached. You know, eventually, every system has these vulnerabilities. Um, and it's so important to have a playbook and have preparedness. OK, when this happens, who does security talk to? Who on the leadership team needs to know? Who in the customer teams to inform people downstream uh, need to be involved? What is your crisis public relations plan? Do you have this already? Um, when we did it, you know, this was, this was like, 
I, I did not want to be involved. There was five people that knew the secret of how to break into all these software systems. And I'm like, why did you tell me? It's like, because you're the CEO. If things go wrong, you're responsible. So um, you want to have that plan. You know, when something does happen, you know, just think through it and just make sure that's in place. Because if it does happen, you, you'll, you, you won't regret it. All right, so thank you so much. This was about the dangerous secrets of open source. In this talk, I, I hope you learned how to blow the head off an armored tank and that nothing useful can be secure. I hope you learned one way to break into a SaaS service. There's many. Um, and I and hope the takeaway there is to have a responsible disclosure policy, an RDP. If there's one thing you all take away from this, um, it's RDP, I hope. Uh, and the last is some of the reasons why um, every company, I believe, needs a, a collaborative security team, one that connects with community, one that connects with the rest of the company, one that is in a leadership role um, in conversations about software and about the business. Um, there is this you know, cliche these days that every company is now a software company. Every company needs to go digital. Well, if that's true, if you're doing anything that's important in digital, you have to be a security company. You have to have that practice. So food for thought, thank you so much. <laughs>